Hey, welcome to the channel. My name is Jason, and here I talk about all things story. The story I am talking about today is episode 61 of my ongoing series, Worth 1,000 Words, where I write a 1,000-word short story inspired by a piece of artwork. And as you know, it's the month of October. That means I've decided to make every single story this month be a horror story or in the supernatural. But I have a confession. This is a bit of a romance. Yes. You're like, wait, Jason, what the hell are you doing here? It's supposed to be gory. It's supposed to be scary. What is this romance you speak of? Well, I argue that it still fits in the supernatural realm. It is a bit horrific. It is tragic. So I hope you give it a chance. It was a blast to write. And I'm so happy I got to come back to an artist that I, I highly admire. One whose um, art I have done in the past. Episode 5, I believe, called Lives by the Lake. Now for the music, I wanted to listen to the Ghost Story soundtrack for obvious reasons. We're talking about a ghost in the daylight. But I don't like to re-listen to albums that often. And I don't know if I I've ever done it here. I may have done it a couple times, but the one I found is called The Black Corner Den and is by an artist or artist, I don't know, called The Atrium Carceri and City's Last Broadcast. Pretty cool name. But it had the haunting vibe I was looking for and matched the artwork expertly. It drove me down a very interesting path that I did not expect. So, with that said, let's check out this week's artwork. This week's artwork is titled A Ghost in Daylight. It's by Alexander Mondragiev, who is a cinematic illustrator out of Los Angeles, California. Now, way, way back in the beginning of this series, I did another one of his pieces of art called Lives by the Lake, and it still remains to be one of my favorites. And its simplicity and the questions it asks and just the overall creepy factor behind it. And so I, I had to go back. Um, I actually just saw this again in the feed. I wasn't looking back to this artist, but I'm completely infatuated with his art. It just has this simple yet realistic quality. It's all about the composition and the lighting. And it's funny because on the surface it looks very rough, but it's honestly just shows his, his mastery of, of color and light and composition. So let us take a closer look at A Ghost in Daylight. Well, first and foremost, I think the most interesting thing is this uh, ghosts, allegedly. She's cut off with the eyes, and I've seen some other art like this, and it, it's interesting because it's not something I would have thought of initially, but it, it's very powerful because, you know, we, we identify, we see emotion through the eyes. That's usually the first place we look, and so cutting that off really just gives this an even more haunting quality. And so this, this woman is uh, just wearing a simple dress, and she's standing on something. I can't tell if it's the ground. It looks elevated to me. And it's almost as if she's standing on sheets or a towel or a, a flat pillow. I can't quite tell. But we have light coming in from the side and it's hitting her lower body, not quite reaching her torso. And so I love the fact, again, that uh, it's a great focal point here. I know Frank Rosetta did a lot of this stuff. I, I, I really appreciate the fact where people add the detail where it's needed and they don't have it where it's not, meaning it's your, your eye is immediately drawn to this figure not any kind of elaborate detail that you're going to see in the background. So again, I'll stop gushing about his art. You know I love it. I'm excited for this one. So Alexander, thanks again for um, contributing unknowingly to, uh, to this little exercise, this project I'm doing. And let's see what I came up with. I see her in the daylight. Only in the daylight. Muted in lifeless debris. Caught in invisible currents I cannot feel. Can she feel? As it stirs around her like particulate in a glass of water, shed from a lemon, perhaps. Her sourness is apparent in the way she looks at me. Does she look at me? I look. What I see is this. A plain woman in a plain dress, standing on a square of folded sheet, not much wider than her shoulders, which sit narrowly on her frame, despite the voluminous material resting there. I see her when I rest. When my feet are tired from the walks from seat to window, not far, but far enough for me. My bones are like splinters, the doctors say. That makes me think of the trees I love so much, but have to admire from afar. Through the window that brings me this lovely apparition in the daylight, 
only in the daylight. I wonder why she visits me, but more so why she doesn't come in the night when all ghosts are rumored to haunt. I've tried to ask her, but she doesn't respond. She is as rigid as those trees I miss, but the trees sway in the wind. Their dead leaves piled outside the room where my bones don't allow me to reach. Another comes through the open window. 801. Foolish games like this occupy my time, which is slowed to the pace of a single grain of sand through an hourglass. The moats and down and outdoor intruders move faster, around her, not through her, like the light. It paints her such a hue, both pretty and pale, showing me nothing of the dark wall that rises behind her. But it only ever reaches her hips, never rising above, no matter the position of the sun. I believe she has a power over it. I believe she has a power over me. How I wish she would respond in some way. The simplest indication that she knew I was here for her, for both of us, to hear her stories of pain and pleasure alike. I would worship her if she wished. Perhaps I do worship her. I grow embarrassed when I think such thoughts, but such thoughts aren't in my control, and she is not in my control. How I wish I had control of her, of my splintered bones, so we may stand in the daylight together both of us naked to the open sky, where I can see her face, free of shadow, so I may make her smile. I limp to the window to see the sky, but only make it halfway, each step the sound of matchsticks snapping. I wait there, until the pain subsides, my back to her, which makes me ache. I tried to look under her dress once, to see what we all yearn for, what I haven't had in some time. It was a mistake. The platform upon which she stands, a table perhaps, a workbench, or even a bed, I'm not sure of its origin, is too high for me. And I should have realized this. Stairs are painful enough. But no, I had to inspect her with my desires, my sick desires. God or gravity or some other force that wanted to see me fall, made me fall, my hungry head upturned to see her secrets, vertigo took hold. I lay there for a day or two, piss and shit myself for a day or two, with quite possibly the worst view of her you could imagine. The angle I lay in showed me nothing but her tailoring, which in this position wasn't the flattering kind. No curled finger, no sculpted jaw, no lock of hair. I was cursed to look at the patterns of her funeral dress, and those patterns frightened me. Flowers twisting into bear traps, tipped with blood and bone. Vertical lines stretching into gallows fit with nooses the size of my neck. Gauze as thick as the cold fog that makes me hurt so much. These thoughts have taken me back from the window, to my seat where I can admire her again in relative comfort. How I wish she would smile. How I wish her eyes would twinkle with recognition. How I wish I could climb upon that accursed, absurd, pointless platform and face her. Hold her. Tell her I am the one she has come for, because I enjoy the daylight too. Then it hits me. A folded sheet. Has she ever stood there without it? That sheet has always been there left behind by the previous owners for no known reason, though I hadn't questioned it, so excited to procure a home in the countryside I had admired since a child. But when my bones fell to disease and became my prison, one I could only admire through a window when my body allowed me the luxury, I think on this matter for some time, study where the dust begins and ends beneath the sheet, mentally mark its exact placement, every fold, because it must be perfect, because she is perfect, because she deserves perfection. When the sun goes to sleep, I go to work. I gather it up, carry it like a fragile relic to the spot near me, 
so she can be near me when the sun rises again. I don't sleep. I can't sleep. The sun finally wakes. It spills across the floor like fresh milk. I want to lap it up. Then it dissipates, diffuses as clouds cross the sky. I curse those clouds, and they flee. They fled to a wind. The shutters clatter against the window, the open window. Wind hurls her sheet out of the room, where the dead leaves gather, where I cannot reach, where no daylight reaches, where daylight never reaches. I stand, I fall, I break. My broken view is of the corner of a white sheet in shadow. So of course I started with a title. Sometimes I do, often I do, and I felt like it put me in the right headspace for this and the right frame of mind because daylight is a, a very important part of the story, as you now well know, because I decided it was the only time this ghost appears to this man, this woman. I'm never really clear on the, the gender, and I think that's more interesting, actually. I also wrote in the present tense, which I rarely do, but for some reason it, it just felt right. I didn't really think about the tense whatsoever. I did, however, think about the POV quite a bit because at first, I was thinking to tell the story from the POV of the ghost and what her story was, but then I decided it might be more interesting if I were to tell the story from the POV of someone who was watching her because I just love the mystery in this figure. You can't see her eyes. Her pose is as ordinary as can be. She's standing what appears to be elevated. I don't know if it is, but that's how I took it. And it's funny, the more I think about it, I'm thinking that that is just light possibly coming from a skylight. I don't know. It's, it's tough to say because you see the light coming from the right side on the window or maybe the uh, behind camera right. So, uh, but because it is, it is rough, I just took it as to be a, um, a piece of sheet, I guess. And I think that was a good thing because, you know, it, it, it basically fueled the rest of the story and, and how um, this tragic tale of, of love, I guess you could call it, blow, the wind blowing this, uh, this sheet across the room because our, our, our protagonist carelessly left the window open. He or she does enjoy it, as I, as I explained. He has a, let's just say it's a, a he for now on for all, for, for the purposes of this discussion. So he um, clearly loved this house. He loved the outdoors. And uh, I made him a prisoner of this house because of his bone condition, whatever that may be. And so I just imagine this kind of tortured soul sitting here waiting for the sun to hit just this spot so this ghost would appear and he could admire her. And that's really what I wanted to do. And I thought of a lot of different ways to end it. Um, this is the one I stuck with. With, and it didn't come to me until the very end, though. You know how I always talk about knowing your endings is very important. However, when you're doing an exercise like this, sometimes it's, it's difficult. A lot of times, I shouldn't say a lot of times, but some of the times I, I see art and I know where I want it to go in terms of how I feel the resolution is going to happen. Like, what is the punchline of the story? This one I didn't know. I had no idea yet. I just kind of wanted to explore the idea of this, this strange woman standing here in the light while uh, this observer observes her and i think what was fun in this story for me is is all of the world building and it's 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 sort of you know it's between the lines it's not uh super apparent everywhere but we have this you know crippled person who um, purchased this house out of admiration for many 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 years there's also the mystery of of what this sheet is here this platform is and i devised all of that because i just couldn't really tell what that area at the bottom was and i know when i was talking about the artwork in the beginning i really appreciate the fact of uh lack of detail or or maybe i should say detail where detail is needed rather than rendering the entire thing in massive detail so i'd be curious to know what that is if it, if it is a patch of sun uh the, the reason why i didn't think it was is there's that that dark uh, mark underneath it and then you can almost see it looks like a reflection of that sheet or that pad or whatever it is um sort of at the very bottom front of the image but anyway um i was i was sitting here and thinking about you know uh what what would go through the head of a person who can't get around very much and who uh, finds himself in, in in the company of this this strange woman? So he's putting uh, her history kind of into, or he's actually wondering. I shouldn't say he's he's actually concocting what her history is because he doesn't really know. He just wonders and he thinks, and and that's all we're left with um, outside of the tragic tale of him falling down and just not being able to get up, never being able to uh, get the sheet back into the daylight because it is blown out of the room into shadow where all the leaves 
have ended up. And that was honestly something I'm not sure if you can tell in the writing because I know it is time lapse very quickly. That is something I had to go back and foreshadow. So a couple other ideas I was thinking about, or actually one other idea was, you know, I was thinking maybe this house was being foreclosed, condemned. Maybe he was a ghost himself. That would be a cool concept because we know light is very powerful in this. I, you know, it's called a ghost in daylight. And I decided it was only in the daylight she appears. I imagine that maybe there was a large sign or something that was going to go up outside in front of the house. House and then just just position just right to block the light and i thought that would have been interesting i was going to kind of see it in the fact that he'd maybe there were scattered letters everywhere that were essentially you know late fees and stuff i know it doesn't <laughs> doesn't sound that interesting um when i when i'm saying it aloud and explaining it in detail but i think that would have been another way to do it one that wasn't it was his fault technically but it was also um a close of his story and the fact that, you know, he loved this house so much and then he also was losing this house and losing her. Um, that would be a great kind of image, right, of the entire the entire um, concept or theme of loss. But I didn't do that. I, I still made it his fault. I, I left the window open, you know, hence why all the leaves were scattered down the hallway where he couldn't reach. And I know there's probably a lot of questions. I'm sure you have a lot of questions about, well, how did he go to the bathroom? Where did he go to the bathroom? How far could he go? Why couldn't he go to the hallway? What room was this? Was this a bedroom? Where was he? You would be right. I mean, those are, those are valid questions and those are things you have to think about, especially when you can find someone to a room who is alone. However, I never said that. I never, I never said it. I never said he wasn't, but, um, I just think that those kind of questions, if you are the way, I, the way I think about it, movies and stories, when you are engrossed, you kind of suspend your, your disbelief. You're not thinking about the, the whys and the hows and, you know, and the what's you're just kind of engrossed in the story. You're just completely overtaken by it and the character and the events that are unfolding. And so while I was thinking about these things, it did hit me that, okay, well, somebody's going to read this or hear this and think well okay here's all these weird plot holes and I, I just said you know what hopefully um i have engaged you enough with the story that you weren't really thinking about that stuff you were in the head of this man because it is in first person and that inherently just gives you i think a closer pov even though you can write very very close in third person which i i tend to prefer i rarely write right in first on these short stories more so than my long form stuff and not only that but but not explaining those things those details kind of just it gave the whole thing a very ethereal quality and speaking of that i you may wonder why the repetition there there's a few lines of repetition in here and when we get to there i will um I think we passed a few, but I'll explain the thought process behind that. So when I look at this image, I think of it, it's it's very poetic. That's that's really it's just this beautiful painting. It feels like something you'd see in a museum, just subtle, rough brush strokes, uh, stuff I would just love to see more of. And in that lack of detail, uh, to me, like just brings more mystery. Because it had this mysterious tone, I, I wanted to create like a poetic kind of cadence to the speech of this person i wanted to use those words as you know repetition as um as power you know to emphasize things and it's funny i noticed after once i read it all the way through again for the recording i noticed i said cursed and i cursed at this and i was cursed and a curse at this and it's funny normally when i go back through a draft i try to remove that stuff because you know it is repetitious and you kind of want to you know remove too much repetition um in writing you want to keep it as you know separate it as far as you can can. But I felt like, you know, once I got there, I was like, you know what? I think this works. I think this is a reason why it would work in this case. And here at the very end, um, as we're getting toward uh, the final line, um, the repetition is coming up, or at least one of them. So here we go. I cursed those clouds and eventually they flee. They fled to a wind, a storm. And here's we, here, here's when I literally am deciding, okay, this is how I'm going to end it right at the end. You know, I forgot to close the window. That is something I seated um, back at the beginning. Uh, so it wouldn't feel so like obvious right now because I think that's one thing you have to keep in mind is uh, oh and here's some repetition and I'll get back to that you know where no daylight is etc cetera, etc cetera. but you don't want to drop a bomb on people at the very end you have to seed it somewhat you cannot just conveniently say oh oops, this, 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 that you've never heard of, because the only thing the reader knows is what's on the page. They can't read the mind of the character or the author. And that's why foreshadowing is so important because you have to make it, all it does is it makes everything feel like it comes together and makes the story feel cohesive. It gives you that aha moment. If you're reading close enough. And so this is where I see it. So this is me going back, foreshadowing. I leave the window open despite strong winds that would warn me otherwise, which I, I believe I tweaked that a little bit, but that is what I'm doing right there.
I'm setting it up. And I know foreshadowing to some people seems like a strange concept because it's not real, right? You know, foreshadowing doesn't always happen in reality or never happens in reality unless it's like a coincidence or it's planned. But um, in fiction, it's different because, you know, fiction is sort of abstracted reality. I know a lot of us try to write something that feels realistic, that feels like it could have really happened. But again, those things like for foreshadowing and subtext and all of that, you got to put in there. It, it's just the art of it. And it really adds that extra layer of, of satisfaction and, and of depth, which leads to that satisfaction, hopefully. And here's some more repetition. Every fold, because it must be perfect, because she is perfect, because she deserves perfection. It's almost, uh, I think it, it works because he's convincing himself in a way, right? It, it's as if the thoughts are rolling out of his head in sequence, just, and, and he's emphasizing that fact to convince himself of these thoughts. So I think it works both from a, uh, you know, a craft standpoint from outside the character, but I feel like it works for the character because this character is kind of a creepy guy. And I like that. I mean, we're trying to do uh, these these five stories I'm going to write are going to be horror themed or in the realm of the supernatural. And I had to make something here creepy because I didn't make, you know, I didn't want to go down the path of, okay, so this girl's been murdered. The guy watching her murdered her or she's going to kill someone else like every other ghost in a, in a horror movie, essentially. And I, I kind of twisted it into somewhat of a, of a tragic love story, I guess. And I don't know. I think, God, I wish I remember the name of this movie. Um, um, it was on Netflix and it was it was like about this girl who lived in this house and there were strange things in the walls but it this painting immediately made me think of that it was just it was like a like a visual poem to me and that's that's what I was trying to create here at least what it ended up being I didn't know when I set out to do it again you know when you're looking at this art when you're listening to certain kinds of music I can't stress how much music affects my writing and if you're not listening to music while you write I think you should try just make sure it's appropriate to what you're writing because it will definitely drive you in the right direction, I feel like. And sometimes I do spend, honestly, more time trying to find the right album to listen to um, than more than the uh, than finding the artwork itself. But this one, I think it was about an hour 20 to get through the entire thing. And I... I did do a lot of back and forth. Again, the foreshadowing because I didn't figure out the end until the very end. And I wanted to make it feel natural, right? I didn't want to feel, okay, well, let me just add one little sentence at the beginning and then I'm done. And in doing that, it made me have to add a lot a lot of other sentences, but I wanted those sentences to have weight again. You know, in this one, I, I went over a little bit, but that overage, that slight overage proved to be more of a challenge than normal. As if I had one regret, I wish I would have had um, him get the idea of his plan a little bit sooner or maybe like he's devising this plan from the very beginning you're not only getting a glimpse into uh his experience with this ghost as, as he observes her but pepper that in or or seed that in through um the plan so like the very beginning he has some plan to capture her or be with her forever rather than just coming up with it um toward the end of the story because presumably you know he's he's thought about this for some time he's been seeing this ghost for some time at least that's how it seems and again more poetic stuff you know i stand i fall i break i have a broken view of a white sheet i love doing stuff like that i know maybe it's a little purple sometimes for people but um I enjoy it. I think there's there's stuff um, between the lines that, that are very powerful that you can do there. Welcome to the end, dear viewer. I am so glad you made it. This is where I talk about my final thoughts, what I liked, what I didn't like, maybe what I learned. So it wasn't too bad to get through, right? I hopefully, hopefully you found something of interest there. It was supernatural. There was a bit of a dirty old man or a dirty old person there kind of creepy with splintery bones you know he had some kind of bone condition he was in this room by himself with an open window where leaves were just scattering across the floor going down the hallway to where he couldn't reach i don't know i felt like it had kind of a creepy vibe to it hopefully you thought the same and i didn't want to do something expected i didn't want to make the the girl the the ghost like some evil girl who's been murdered and is coming back for revenge like you see in so many horror movies I didn't want to make our narrator the killer of this girl and he's just being haunted by her. I wanted to do something else. And so I waffled back and forth about POV. POV is so important and it changes the story drastically. And you don't see the POV character here, our narrator. He's observing this figure, but he didn't kill her. He bought this house out in the countryside and he, come, he came to discover that a ghost shows up only in the daylight and he becomes infatuated with her. 
in love with her. He wants to worship her, as he states himself. So at the very least, I hope that was a, an interesting departure to the uh, the normal ghost story. You never uh, learn the fate of this young woman, this ghost. You never really learned uh, much about this guy, other than he has been pining for this old countryside house since he was a kid and then he has some kind of bone condition and i like that i, I feel like there's so much power and interest in stories uh it's not really the information of stories to me that bring the power it's the interactions it's the characters that is really what sells it for me and hopefully it sells it for you too because that is exactly what i focused on here so things i didn't like i wish i would have um come up with maybe a slightly clever ending perhaps it was okay. Again, I didn't know it until I got to the, literally the very last paragraph, the last couple of paragraphs. So I had to go back and seed it. Again, that's that's pretty par for the course, but I had a couple of other ideas floating in my mind, which I talked about in the writing a little bit. So if you want to check that out, if you missed it, go back and listen to that. But I like the poetic nature of it. As I said, I felt like this was a visual poem to me. And so I wanted to have that repetition, the cadence of certain kinds of language and Hopefully I achieve that. But all in all, I think it was it was a success. I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you'd like to support the channel, give me a like if you liked the video. Subscribe for story-related content. Check out my longer form books in the description below. And keep reading, keep writing, and I will see you next week. Thanks. Bye. If you'd like to read the story in its non-video format, check the link in the description. I didn't edit anything else. Promise. Thanks again.